Oh. Hey, welcome to... Oh, it's you. You're not here to buy anything, are you? Well, welcome to the shop anyway. I've been playing this game called Moonlighter and it's inspired me to get into some merchant work. Come to think of it, I do have some thoughts on the game. I mean, it's pretty interesting how they incorporated merchant work into an RPG. Hey, wait, wait where are you going? Mark, come back! Travel with me, if you would, all the way back to the long forgotten age of 2018 BCE, when a little Spanish studio called Digital Sun released a game called Moonlighter, a combination of classic Zelda and, I don't know, working retail, I guess? See, the thing about Moonlighter is half the game involves being a merchant, selling the stuff you find when you're off looting dungeons, hence the title. By night you dive into the dungeons to gather more treasures to sell the next day. And you'd be surprised how much fun it can be to sell goods. The way this game starts led me to believe that the shop was something that Will, the main character, didn't much care for and that he would soon leave it behind in favor of his true passion of smacking rocks and jelly globs in nasty old caves. But actually, running the shop is a crucial part of the game and its gameplay loop, so you don't find money when you're dungeon diving. Technically you can get money in dungeons after you pick up a certain tool, but the real money lies in taking your spoils back to the store and selling it to the townspeople. There have been other games where you could sell your stuff to shopkeepers, but I struggled to think of a game in which you actually owned a store and took an active part in the sale of your own goods like this. Now, conceptually this is not exactly thrilling, but Digital Sun has done a great job at making this merchant work really interesting and engaging. Far from being a matter of hitting the sell button while scrolling through a menu, Moonlighter has you physically placing merchandise on displays and assigning a price to them. Pricing is entirely guesswork as far as I can tell. Value is determined by the customer. Yay capitalism! When someone looks at your goods, they'll react according to how they think it should be priced. Frowns meaning something's overpriced, and this meaning they've got a deal on their hands. All this means that when you return from plundering a new dungeon, you've got a bunch of unknown stock to sell. So you're assigning all these prices, in my case usually erring on the side of overpricing, and when the customers come in, everybody's looking at different stuff, and this thing's too expensive, gotta change that. Oh, whoa, this one's clearly way underpriced, need to change that. Oh, I changed this one too much. Hey, where the hell are you going? Boy, that escalated quickly. Then you have some days when your stock is more of a known quantity, and it's just a matter of setting it up and waiting for people to buy. But there are still things to consider, especially later in the game. You've got thieves to watch out for, orders to take, and the popularity of a given item changing its value. But there's more to do outside of Moonlighter's walls. At first, your shop is the only point of interest in the village, but over time you can bring in other businesses providing different services, like a blacksmith, a potion seller, an asshole, or a banker. These businesses also factor into your decision on what to sell in the shop. I can sell this thing for a good chunk of change, but I could use it to upgrade my spear. And these crystals are important for enchantments. Better hold on to those. The village economy does a good job of pacing the game. More money means better equipment to face the dungeons. I never got enough money in one hall to immediately breeze through a dungeon, but I never felt like I wasn't making good progress toward my goals. When the sun sets, the shop closes its doors, and it's time to venture into the dungeons. Some are more dangerous than others, and ultimately you never know what you're going to get with a given dungeon, but if you don't go in, you got nothing to sell the next day. Venture in too deep, though, and you may never be seen again. So it helps to be prepared. Hunger can strike at any time. So chocolate and jerky are essential. Make sure to bring something to keep the chocolate cool. The last thing you want is melted chocolate. You should probably bring a weapon too. Actually, uh, I'll, I'll come back tomorrow in the daytime. Yeah. While running the shop is a huge part of the game, the dungeons and combat are likely what one would be most curious about when hearing about this game. This is where the classic Zelda style I mentioned at the top comes in. The camera perspective, the grid-like dungeon layout, and to some extent the combat itself is very much inspired by Zelda, and Digital Sun is not shy about it. 
just to be clear, I've never actually played a classic Zelda myself. Most of what I know is through cultural osmosis, but it's pretty hard to mistake the resemblance. In any case, Moonlighter's dungeons and their combat encounters have a lot of good qualities to them. There's a wealth of interesting enemy designs, a small but varied arsenal of weapons to choose from, and a novel take on inventory management. Some enemies are better dealt with from a distance, some have you considering your positioning as they fire on you, and some require provocation before you slice their gooey bits. There's a nice variety in enemy functions and an even greater variety in visual design. Each dungeon also has a unique boss at the bottom of its depths, as well as a sub-boss that appears in the earlier levels. Some bosses are harder than others. In fact, one of them I only beat because I think the AI bugged out? Either that or it just got tired of fighting. That said, I only had that isolated experience with bugs and that kind of thing, otherwise this game is very polished. Anyway, I think now's as good a time as any to address the procedural generation. Personally, I've always been hesitant to play games with procedural generation. I've tried games like Binding of Isaac and Dead Cells, but I just couldn't stick with them. And it's hard to say exactly what made the difference here, but I had no problem with Moonlighter's procedural generation. I think it's the self-containment of the dungeons. They're like known unknown quantities. You've got this village which is in the real world, all completely handcrafted and static, and then the dungeons are in another dimension, and they're all helpfully labeled. Golem dungeon, forest dungeon, desert dungeon, etc. Ah shit, was it in here? Uh, yeah, fuck, I could have sworn it was around here. Somewhere. Nope, not down here. Oh, where's this damn cave? Oh, fuck! Oh, nope, not that way. Uh, God, anybody seen a cave over here? Shit. It also helps that you can leave the dungeons without dying. You'll probably still die a fair amount, but it's not required. Having not played many roguelikes, my general impression is that progress is made by just going until you die and trying again. Moonlighter has a less dire approach to progression. If you die, you only keep a handful of your stuff, and you want to keep as much as possible to sell or use later. But ultimately, you can only carry so much. One of the more eye-catching parts of Will's attire is his big honkin' backpack. Of course, it makes sense that it's so big given all the junk you're hauling back to the shop, but even so, after a few trips into the dungeon, your gamer sense TM will probably prompt you to wonder, when am I gonna get to expand my inventory? You're constantly having to weigh your choices on what to put in your bag and what to dispose of, and it can be tough sometimes. So naturally you would expect your inventory to expand at some point, but it doesn't. Actually, Digital Sun finds some very creative ways around the need to expand your inventory. For example, some items found in chests will have curses, like being fragile or having to be put on a particular side of the menu, and there are other enchanted objects that can break curses and allow things to be stacked together. There are even enchantments that will send items immediately back to your store. And there are even secret rooms with chests that do the same thing for however much you want to send back. Boom! Suddenly your inventory is completely open. Beyond that, you also get the ability to open a portal inside dungeons before too long. It costs money, but essentially allows you to save your progress and take all your loot home with you. It's a pretty smart set of solutions. Doing the easy thing of expanding the inventory presents the problem of having too many items and making it tedious and or confusing to sort through everything. And this game has basically gotten around that without forcing you to leave too much precious loot behind. I probably don't need to tell you at this point, but Moonlighter has a gorgeous art style with a lot of personality. The colors and designs are stellar. The village of Rinoka just has a lovely warmness to it, and the dungeons also have lots of charm between the enemy designs and the environment. And it's not just down to the visuals either, this game has some excellent music too. I can't tell you how many times I've found myself humming the shop tune or the song that plays in the village. I also just love the little details with the music, like how the village song shifts when you visit different shops. So good! And the dungeon music deserves just as much love. I kept waiting for a dip in quality in the dungeon music, but it just kept proving itself. Uh, I'm sorry, is that a damn bassoon? Wow. Okay, now that I'm done gushing over the visuals and the music, let's talk about the UI. It's incredibly intuitive. I did sometimes have trouble with the controls, but they do let you remap almost every button, which I love. 
anyhow, the UI itself is kind of brilliant, which is good because you'll be spending a lot of time looking at inventory screens between looting and selling. There are buttons for quickly moving an item from one menu to another, as well as a button that moves items in bulk in the same way. There's also a button that will quickly take you to a detailed description of whatever item you're hovering over. Oh, gotcha. The curses and enchantments I mentioned earlier are also clearly labeled, making their effects recognizable at a glance. This shoe, for instance, has some wicked powers. <laughs> you can tell from the smell. There's also a wishlist function letting you highlight any items that are important for crafting gear. The game also helpfully displays commands and useful information along the edges of the screen at all times so as to not get in the way. It's not all perfect though. Moonlighter tends to follow the less is more method of instruction. Do it! This works for me for the most part, but some things took longer to figure out than I would have liked. For example, there are some things you'll collect in dungeons that seem rare or even unique, particularly stuff you get from defeating the dungeon's boss. I squirreled this stuff away for quite a while because I thought it would be important for something later, but it wasn't. And then there are things like this pen full of creatures that you can enlist to follow you, which I don't remember ever being mentioned by the game, or this big green goopy monster that will suddenly spawn in, or the fact that things held in this row of your inventory are kept upon death. And I still don't know how to get a note from a monster, but everybody sure seems to want one. A lot of the stuff you can eventually suss out, but I don't think it would be overbearing to just briefly explain it. The game also opts for a lot of strictly visual tutorials. And yes, pictures are universal, but sometimes I was a little confused about exactly what they were trying to get across. Again, I eventually figured it out, but a little text description to go alongside the visuals wouldn't hurt. If I had one other complaint about the game, it would be that I didn't much care for the fourth dungeon. And it was mostly that it seemed sort of anachronistic. It just felt very modern in contrast to all the previous dungeons. I was also just starting to get a little fatigued knowing that there was another dungeon after this one. But then the last dungeon actually feels rather short. There's a bunch of plot stuff in text form and then you fight the final boss. It was all interesting, don't get me wrong, just felt a little short. I think the pacing would have felt a little better if there were just three dungeons and the final dungeon was expanded on so there was more build up to the final encounter. All that said, there wasn't a part of the game I really disliked, just some things that I thought could be better. It's a really solid game. So Digital Sun dropped a chunky piece of DLC a year after Moonlighter's release called Between Dimensions. It has everything you could really ask for. New weapons, new equipment, new shops, more story content, and of course, a big juicy new dungeon. I put the DLC into its own segment because while it does feel like an extension of the main game and all of the elements are basically the same, there are some notable differences. Each of the dungeons in the main game has unique enemies. Some of them are very similar to enemies in other dungeons, but they're all at least somewhat distinct. In the DLC dungeon, there are still new enemies, but they're mixed in with baddies from previous dungeons, which will drop the same, relatively less valuable loot. And the nature of this new dungeon is a little different too. All the previous ones had three layers. The layers would change every time you went in, but you would always know how far you were from your end goal. In this dungeon, there are 10 floors. And none of this stuff is a problem, really. But when you put all of it together, Moonlighter starts to feel, to me, like a more typical roguelike game. The progression feels more piecemeal, like you're just feeling your way forward, getting an armor upgrade here and a new weapon there. Even the economy of the game has ballooned to a point where it sort of feels like you're working with Monopoly money. Again, this is not really a negative, but a matter of personal preference. I just personally preferred operating in the smaller, more self-contained dungeons. I'm not really into the roguelike genre in its typical form, but obviously there are plenty of people who are. Listen, don't tell anyone, but I didn't finish the DLC. I, I played it for a while, but eventually I got burned out for the reasons I just mentioned. There are definitely some cool looking bosses and such later on, but I just didn't feel compelled to get myself to that point. But hey, if you're into roguelikes in general, 
this part should be just as enjoyable as the main game, so no shade thrown. Ah. <sighs> this is a little much for me. Still pretty good though. The shop concept is pretty novel. And I really enjoyed the main game. Lots of interesting monster designs, music, overall atmosphere is pretty good. I give this one two thumbs up. Go play it. I'm just gonna take a nap here. closer oh I think it's oh god not this again that's right it's patreon time come get your premium patreon subscription today it's an opportunity you cannot afford to pass up on with prices starting at one dollar a month you'd be robbing yourself if you didn't give me money but don't take my word for it listen to this satisfied patron wait what is this for if you're on the fence about whether you want to give me money, just look at all these dazzling benefits that you're currently missing out on. Act now! This deal is only available until Patreon shuts down, and who knows when that could be. It could happen right now! While you're at it, you may as well like this video and subscribe to my channel. You've come this far, haven't you? It's the right thing to do, so get cracking. I'll see you next time.